It's hard not to be captivated by soap bubbles. They form such interesting shapes. Take, for instance, this soap bubble stretched between two identical rings. The shape that the bubble forms is called a catenoid, or a catenary curve that has been rotated around an axis to form a surface. A catenary curve is the same shape that a rope makes when it's only supported at its two ends. It's described by a hyperbolic cosine function. This result is found by applying the tools in calculus of variations. Since soap bubbles follow a minimization principle, they are always trying to fit into the lowest energy state possible. For a soap bubble, the lowest energy state is directly correlated with the smallest surface area. This minimization principle is why free-floating bubbles form spheres, since a sphere has the smallest surface area of any surface for a given volume. To minimize the surface area, we add up all the small contributions in this integral. Then we take the derivative of the whole thing and set it equal to zero. This gives us the Euler-Lagrange equation. After solving for y as a function of x, we receive the hyperbolic cosine function. In this function, c is an integration constant, and it's determined by the size of the rings and how far apart they are. Now, that's all fine and good, but I want to see what happens when these things collapse. I'm going to shoot some high-speed footage and see what happens when we pull this so far that it breaks. I mounted two micro-manipulators provided by Dr. J. Demas on a breadboard and attached two rings fabricated with the help of Devin Lackey. I filmed it all with a Motion Extra N3 high-speed camera, also provided by Dr. Demas. Now let's see the results. This first shot was filmed at 600 frames per second. The black line at the top is one of the rings. There are so many intriguing things in this footage, but let's start before the catenoid breaks. If we look back at the hyperbolic cosine function and enter con the constraint that it must equal the radius of the rings at the ends, we can find a relationship between the parameters a, r, and l. Using this relationship, we can graph the neck radius a versus the separation l as dimensionless variables. Here's our graph, with a as the neck radius and l as the distance between the two rings. Now we have a maximum a here as long as we hold our r's constant. And we also have two different solutions for any given separation, one with a thin neck and one with a thick neck. In addition to these thin and thick neck catenoid solutions, there's another solution which we saw in the video, and that is two films, one on each ring. Now, for each of the three bubble configurations, let's plot the surface area as a function of the distance between the rings, again as dimensionless variables. For the two films, there is a constant surface area. The wide neck catenoid's surface area constantly increases until it gets to point E, which is the maximum separation. The narrow neck catenoid always has a surface area greater than the other two. Thus, this solution is unstable, since the soap bubble wants to be at the lowest surface area possible. For most separation lengths, the wide neck catenoid solution is the minimal surface area possible until we get to here, 1.05 times the separation length, at which point the two films become the minimal surface area possible. Thus, we expect that at this point, the catenoid collapses down to the two films. Looking back at the footage, though, it doesn't go right from the wide neck solution down to the two films. What we actually see is that as the separation distance gets larger, we actually hop up from the wide neck catenoid to the narrow neck catenoid and then we collapse down to the two films. We can make sense of this result by graphing the surface energy of the bubble against the neck radius. For a small separation length, the graph looks approximately like this. Notice this is the global minimum point. This is the wide neck catenoid solution. This is a global maximum, and this is the narrow neck catenoid solution. And this solution right here, which is between the two, this is the two films on each ring. For a larger separation, the graph starts to look like this second curve. This is still the global minimum. However, as the separation between the rings grows even bigger, the graph starts to look like this. The wide neck catenoid is no longer the global minimum. The two films is the global minimum. However, as we've gone from a small separation between the rings to a large separation between the rings, the catenoid has stayed in this minimum. It's still a local minimum here, so it does follow the minimization principle. Ultimately, the bubble does want to be at the global minimum, but at local minimums, the minimization of the integral is still achieved. As this graph increases even more to look like this, this is the point at which the catenoid will go from the wide neck solution 
through the narrow neck solution down to the two films. Let's try to see this, this time zoomed in on the catenoid and at 1000 frames per second. By the way, the satellite bubble at the end is formed because of air pressure in the catenoid. As the catenoid collapses, the air pressure in the middle of the catenoid keeps that part of the film from collapsing as fast as the outer parts. 